Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So good to see you. I uh, know some of you, and I hope that uh, in a few days I will be able to get to know every one of you. Um, I am Takis Metaxas. I teach computer science here. Um, and um, probably one of the surprising things that uh, you may find when you hear that a computer scientist is leading the Albright Institute is like, you know, how come these are scientists supposed to be dealing with different things? Um, I have been interested in not only science, not only computer science, but everything that um, affects our world. And uh, uh, it is something I cannot help. It is, you know, caring about uh, um, what can improve in the world is what I do for breakfast. Um, and one of the most exciting parts of my life is uh, being able to be a teacher and uh, uh, having this continuous communication. I've been teaching at Wellesley for uh, 26 years now, incredible as it may sound. But um, I've gone through getting to know a large uh, collection of people who have been sitting in uh, your desks and uh, I am always amazed by the progress I have seen them make and the difference they make in the world. So um, I'm one of the people responsible in choosing the theme uh, this year. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about how we chose it and um, uh, how we thought about it. So as you know, the Albright Institute aims to help you prepare for a more nuanced understanding of the world, especially since you will be undertaking an internship uh, this summer in some location outside the places you have lived uh, in the past. Um, and as I said, we're very happy to see you here, not uh, because uh, we know that you're here, not because you want to just improve your resume. In particular, you're here because you want to improve the lives and uh, uh, intellectual experiences of others, uh, those who may not have had the luck uh, and opportunity to the quality education that you're lucky enough to receive. Um, you shouldn't feel bad for having uh, the good experience of having quality education. What you should be interested in is trying to see how you can share your experiences with others. That's what makes it worth. Uh, understanding better the major challenges we're facing and preparing for addressing them is at the core of the Institute's uh, mission. And that's something we take into account as we think of an overarching theme in every winter session. Uh, this year's theme is challenges to democracy authoritarianism, and new technologies. Um, in the next few minutes, I would like to discuss why we decided uh, to think about democracy uh, and why this is important um, and relevant topic uh, of the world we live in. And you will also, those of you who already know me, you know that when I'm in the classroom, I usually have slides and I speak at a speed about 10 times faster than I do now. Uh, but I'm trying to slow down. That's why I have my written notes. Uh, so that I'll give you time to um, uh, think a little bit and digest some of the things that um, I will be uh, mentioning. Uh, if you read the news, uh, you will likely not be surprised that we're focusing on the challenges that democracy is facing today. Uh, yet, I personally cannot digest that well into the 21st century, we worry about democracy, a concept that has been considered as a self-evident good for a long time, or at least that's what we thought. After all, we have over 100 democracies in the world today, and arguably is the most looked upon system of governance by the majority of people on Earth. But democracy wasn't always the popular system of governments that uh, most people think today it is. In fact, it took many thousands of years before people thought of democracy as a system that would even be possible. In ancient times, when muscular strength was the way of expressing power, a male king was the default leader. Kingdoms were the archetypical form of governance. When societies adopted laws, they were created to enable the enforcement of the king's decisions on his subjects. Laws did not apply to kings who were believed to derive their power from God directly, or they were gods themselves. It was this association with God that gave kings the legitimacy. And it worked as long as people believed it to be true. And this was also the situation in ancient Athens 2,600 years ago. 
But at some point, kingdoms fail because heredity cannot guarantee that the son of a good king is also good or even competent. And when kings fall, tyrants fill the gap. Tyrants lacked the legitimacy that was provided through God's association. There is usually no time to create the myths that will back a tyrant with, uh, you know, legitimacy. So uh, tyr tyrannies had also laws, but laws um, were, like in kingdoms, established to enable the enforcement of the tyrant's decisions on the citizens, the members of the city-state. However, unlike kings, God sent power, tyrants' powers had to be imposed by armed militia of local or foreign troops. There was no sense of justice, and people naturally revolt against what they feel unjust. Democracy was invented to end tyrannical rule. It was created to give a sense of justice that citizens were seeking. The world democracy, demokratia in Greek, combines the elements of demos, which means people, and kratos, which means power. Democracy literally means people power. Laws and rights in a democracy are not derived from God. They're not enforced by militia. Laws are voted by a majority of citizens and they are respected by all the citizens not just the majority. The minority accepts that because there are also laws established to protect them. In a democracy, majorities and minorities are not permanent. They may change through elections. So members of the current majority have an interest in adopting fair laws because they know that at some point in the future, they may become minority. There are always fundamental questions about citizenship and taxation, which is eligible to, uh, as a citizen to vote and how the government is being funded. But let's postpone this discussion just for a little while. Imagine for the moment how radical this system of governance was in a world that had only seen authoritarian kings and tyrants. Laws in a democracy are voted by a majority of citizens. But why voting for laws and rights is a good idea anyway? It gives a first of sense, a fairness, sure. It makes people feel safer, sure. But does it work? Is it even possible to have wise decisions ba made by anonymous people instead of known leaders? Such questions have been posted since the very early establishment of the first democracy. You may have heard of dialogues between the early philosophers about these questions. If you haven't, make it as part of your summer reading because it is pretty interesting. So back to the questions, why voting is a good idea. I would say that democratic decisions are wise because of what we call today the power of crowdsourcing. This is a term you often hear, on, uh, hear online, but what is crowdsourcing? Crowdsourcing is a characteristic of uh, any relatively large society. It is based on the following observation. Most of the people, not always, most of the time, the majority of engaged citizens, when they think independently, can come to a decision that is better than the decision taken by any single one of them. All of the above components are important. Democracy works well when you have engaged, independently thinking citizens taking an active interest in their decisions. It does not work well if you have disengaged citizens who form echo chambers and only some of them care to just vote for representatives or referenda once every few years. What you get in the latter case is a populist version of democracy. Disengaged people who get their information from feel-good echo chambers may vote for a celebrity, not a wise leader. Democracy gives rights but also expects responsibilities from its citizens. This is a crucial aspect that's often overlooked, maybe because people by our nature would rather not think about responsibilities. A fundamental democratic responsibility is 
active participation in the life and decision of the demos, of the shared society. Those who do not want to participate in the common matters and would rather care only for their own private interests, in Greek they are called idiotes, idiots. Seriously, I didn't make this up. <laughs> the world of personal interest in Greek is idion. You have encountered these words in various contexts. Uh, for example, the word uh, idiomatic and idiosyncratic comes from the same root. We usually think of the right to vote as the primary component of a democracy. Voting is instead a very basic responsibility of the citizen. If you're not voting, you do not care about the common matters. You're obviously idiotis, an idiot. But voting is just one component. It is a necessary but not sufficient component for a democracy. Let's remember that. Democracy works well when you have engaged, independently thinking citizens, taking an active interest in the decisions about common matters. Democracy can exist for only as long the citizens are willing to defend it. This became apparent soon after the Athenians chose democracy over tyranny. They were attacked. Their ex-tyrant was leading foreign troops, hoping to impose tyranny again. In the Battle of Marathon, the number of subjects fighting for the tyrant was far greater than the number of democratic citizens fighting for the rights to live free. In the end, it was the will of citizens to sacrifice their own lives to defend their freedom that won. So this is a lesson not to be missed. Democracy's strength goes only as far as the will of citizens to defend it. In the approximately 200 years that democracy was the system of governance in Athens and other Greek cities, we see an, an unprecedented booming of the arts and sciences. Philosophy, mathematics, Physics, theater, literature, poetry, sculpture, architecture, education, critical thinking, they bloom at a rate that the world has not seen and will not see for thousands of years after that. Apparently, giving power to individuals to make their own decisions is kindling innovation and creativity. We are still looking with awe at the progress made by a relatively small group of democratic citizens during what we now call their golden era. That fact was not lost by the victorious rebels in the American colonies when they overthrew the rule of the British king. When choosing their system of governance 230 years ago, they chose democracy. And that decision sparked social and national revolutions around the world. That's how democracies are born. But how do they die? Democracy died in the ancient world when citizens failed to attend to their responsibilities and defend their rights. Its failure was enabled by the rise of charismatic populist leaders that believed in lies, nowadays we call them fake news, and persuaded the citizens to initiate selfish wars instead of maintaining peace. One of them, famous Alkiviadis, his wealthy upbringing, his good looks, and populist rhetoric persuaded Athenians that they, would, they should start new wars in order to pretty much make Athens great again. I didn't make this up either. It was part of a discussion that Secretary Albright and uh, Professor Mary Lefkowitz had a couple of years ago in the Albright Winter Session of uh, 2017. Needless to say, the acceptance of populist leaders' ambitions did not end up well for Athenians. Weak from the adjust wars, Athenian democracy was defeated. And the same was true for the Roman Republic that came shortly after. It took 1800 years for people to get power away from kings, emperors, and tyrants and back into their own hands. The number of democracies increased after the end of the First World War when the colonial European empires lost power and legitimacy for inflicting a disastrous war upon their subjects. But many of these new democracies were weak and were abolished by the rise of fascism and Nazism. One distinct characteristic of the rise of the fascistic regimes was the emergence of powerful authoritarian and populist leaders that took advantage of new technologies. I'll tell you more about that soon. These 
fascist leaders manage to seize government, not through elections, but nevertheless using procedures allowed in democracy. But once in government, they use their power to abolish democracy. Democracies need to be able to defend themselves against those who try to abolish them. And this can only become, come from the people. So remember this lesson. Democracy's strength goes only as far as the will of citizens to defend it. Fascists remained in power by organizing their own fanatic militia, <coughs> promoting hate, vengeance, and lies about racial supremacy. The fact that they were allowed to form and organize such groups should not be underestimated. The fascist and Nazi squads were an essential tool in the hands of the authoritarian leader. But let me make one more observation here. New technologies used without check can undermine democracy. I'm referring to the use of the new, back then, technology of radio that allowed Hitler and Mussolini to broadcast their hateful speeches and reach millions of people without being questioned. Here is how Secretary Albright describes radio's power in her book, Fascism, A Warning. Citizens of the Reich were fed a steady diet of propaganda at the workplace, in public rallies, and over the rapidly evolving medium of radio. The Führer was the first dictator with the ability to reach 80 million people in a single instant with a unifying summons. Radio was the internet of the 1930s, but being a one-way means of communication, it was easier to control. Never had such an efficient tool for manipulating the human mind made available. For a time, Hitler's major speeches were global events. In schools, meanwhile, Mein Kampf was a sacred text. We studied, we studied it as the Bible. Hatred was our creed, recalls one student. The voice of the angry and hateful leader proved more potent than the articles in newspapers arguing the pros and cons of an issue. This new radio, this new power, here is where I need to change my technology. The new power that radio enjoyed in the 1930s over printed word should not be underestimated. The written word requires time to consume, giving a chance to the mind to evaluate its premises. The written word, radio on the other hand, was talking directly to the heart, steering strong feelings, surrounding, allowing no time for the mind to evaluate. Those of you familiar with Daniel Kahneman's seminal work on mind system one and system two may recognize that um, radio engages our emotional system one while the printed word needs our system two that can do more of the critical thinking work. This is very relevant today as we think of uh, social media. The fall of the fascist regimes came at a massive cost for humanity in terms of human lives and destruction. Secretary Albright's book describes in great length the disastrous results of fascism and gives us a warning not to let this happen again, never again. And yet here we are now, almost a century after the rise of fascism, talking about the emergence of new authoritarian leaders that challenge democracy. Just three generations after the generation that saw the death of over 70 million people, we seem to be forgetting the destruction that fascism and Nazism brought to the world. This fact is not, the fact that it is not the first time that democracy is facing severe challenges from authoritarian leaders does not make the current challenges unimportant or less dangerous. In many ways, this time the attacks are even more dangerous due to the great power of newer technologies. Authoritarian leaders weaponize communication technologies that are more powerful than radio to speak to each individual directly, sending a different message to each recipient. They're able to monitor each citizen's actions and disengage, confuse, distract, misinform, scare. As with radio in the 1930s, social media can instill hatred and fanaticism. And compared to the power of Facebook, Twitter, and other social media, radio was a rather primitive tool. What creates hatred and fanaticism now? In the 1930s, 
It was the economic depression and humiliating defeats that created anger and encouraged hatred. Today, people in the West, at least, may not feel humiliated from a recent war, but they are told to be scared because they are under attack by immigrants who want to steal their land, their jobs, and their culture. People are not experiencing the financial depression of the 1920s, but they see their salaries staggering with, while others in distant lands are enriching themselves. People are bombarded by pictures and videos every minute, and pictures as, as the proverb goes, worth a thousand words. But these words do not have to be true. They may be lies taken out of context, aiming to disengage, to confuse, to distract, to misinform, and to scare. Statistically speaking, living conditions today are far better than ever before, certainly better before uh, than what they were in the 1920s. However, we are not the same generation that lived through the first half of the 20th century. What we consider as an acceptable living standard today has dramatically increased, in large part due to the successes of democracy. But the micro-targeting enabled by the monitoring of our lives through the internet allows propagandists to send the most effective message to each one of us. And to those of us who may resist such an attack, they can send an overwhelming volume of messages, confusing and distracting us. On social media and on video, misinformation, exaggeration, fake news, and powerful propaganda is bypassing our thinking process and directly uh, targets our fears. What are we supposed to do in this situation? The first thing we should do is defend democracy. It's not difficult for one to find flaws in particular aspects of democracy as it has involved. Not everyone has the right to vote, though the percentage of eligible citizens is the highest ever. No, everyone has the opportunity to be educated in becoming an engaged citizen, though the number of educated citizens has grown over time. Not everyone has financial ability to fend off, to fend off health problems, though the number of citizens under health coverage has increased recently. Not everyone who lives in a country and contributes to its workforce has the right to become a citizen, though millions in the past did. But we should not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's not forget that all of these improvements were possible due to democracy. Monarchies and authoritarian regimes are not working to improve the condition of the many, but of the few, of those chosen through heredity and or obedience. It is democracy that gives a path for every member of the society to grow and contribute. It is democracy that is founded on people power. He who does not care about reducing the suffering of the people and increase their well-being, he may not care about democracy. The rest of us will defend it. But how about technology? Should we worry about it, especially since it can be used to hack our culture and our mental abilities? Isn't technology bad, after all? Technology is not bad or good, and it's not neutral either. It is precisely what you use it for. So we better put it to good use, supporting our human experience and sharing its benefits. We cannot ignore technology because it is part of who we are as a species. Notice that we're always talking about new technologies. We rarely talk about old technologies because they have become part of who we are, part of our minds, our bodies, of our cultures. And I'm not only talking about embedded technologies that, part, that are part of us, that, like glasses and contact lenses. Without all technologies, humans would be a different species. That's quite a statement, right? So let me defend it. Technology has been with us humans since the beginning of our time on the planet. It was the technology of controlling fire that cooked our food and helped us increase the number of our brain neurons for 70, more than 70% over the next species. The technology of controlling fire for cooking separates us from the other primates, made it possible for us to feed ourselves within a few hours and then spend the rest of the time thinking and producing. The other apes spend eight to 10 hours just feeding themselves every day. There is no time for them to do anything else. It was the technology of writing 
the technology of using symbols like the hieroglyph hieroglyphics, the alphabets and ideograms to represent phonemes and concepts that created literature and culture. It was the technology of metallurgy for tools that created agricultural revolution and established villages and cities. It was the technology of printing press that sparked the enlightenment and educated people by the millions. And it is the technology of the internet that enables massive communication and is creating a global human civilization. All of these technologies improved humans, not just human condition. But of course, there is another aspect to technology and this contribution, because for each one of these examples of technologies producing benefits, you can find instances that can produce disasters. Fire can burn villages. Writing can produce fanaticism. Metallurgy can create bombs. The printing press can spread propaganda. And the internet can spread hatred all over the world. Technology is not good or bad. And it's not neutral. And you cannot ignore it. How technology is used is in our own hands. We need to use it for good so that we can all benefit from it. Now, of course, the story does not end here. Soon, the new technologies of today will become old. They will become transparent. They will become part of our culture, of who we are. And what we regard today as future technologies will be the technologies of tomorrow, will be the new technologies. It is not too early to start thinking now about how we will put these future technologies into good use instead of reacting after the fact that um, what happened is something we do not approve as a society. For example, we will soon enjoy more of the products of artificial intelligence, deep learning, robotics, DNA editing, bioengineering. All of them, and many others that we cannot even imagine now, will become part of the world that we will live in the next century, that you will live in the next century. Um, you may expect, actually, to use for the next 100 years. So keep preparing. One of the obvious areas of concern is the change in the number and types of jobs humans may not have to do anymore. Usually, we think of the jobs of truck drivers and taxi drivers that would be taken away by self-driven cars. But there are others, like lawyers and radiologists. Personally, I would not mind not to have to fight through the Boston traffic and uh, uh, watch my blood pressure go rubber coaster as I'm driving into uh, coming to going home. But um, I, I would rather take a nap. So, <laughs> however, what jobs are we going to retrain today's professional drivers, lawyers, or radiologists to do if they lose their jobs? Who's going to be making these decisions? An authoritarian leader, a corporation, or democratic citizens? And how do we make sure that people's wages or insurance coverage can allow them to take advantage of the medical technologies that we develop? Capitalism and globalization are producing a lot of wealth, but they create inequalities that can be devastating, especially in places where citizens have no control of their fate. These are not just economic decisions. These are political decisions that people in a democratic society will have a chance of making. But without democracy, it's unlikely that the decision makers will take into account the interest of the people. And let's go a step further. As we mentioned, a democracy can only exist as long as citizens are willing to defend it. So let's think about this possible future. Robotics will make it possible to fight wars remotely using intelligent robots. This will save a lot of human lives, dramatically reducing the number of soldiers needed. This is great news, as long as citizens are in charge of the best intelligent robots. Can this happen without democracy? These are some of the crucial questions that we will be discussing in the next three weeks, and yet is only a partial list of the questions we may be thinking about during the next um, few days. While not every one of the talks and panels are closely related to the overarching themes, 
Um, we will start today with a panel featuring PBS NewsHour anchor Judy Woodruff and Provost Andy Shannon, entitled The Press in the Age of Populism. And we will end with a dinner dialogue featuring Secretary Albright's Ambassador Samantha Power and, and Harvard Professor Cass Anstein, entitled Challenges to Democracy, pretty much on the theme we're talking today. So like you, I can't wait until I experience all of these talks and all of the thinking process that goes with it. As I said, as a computer scientist, you can imagine that finding um, a job these days that pays multiple times the salary of a Wellesley professor is not difficult. But this excitement that I get from being with you in these 26 years now can be paid off otherwise. Thank you very much.